Good evening. Can you hear us okay? Lovely. I'm Jeanette Aakwai, actually, the Indigenous Outreach and Learning Coordinator at the Royal Ontario Museum. I'll start with that. Okay, and I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Okay, I'm Mark Angstrom. I'm a Deputy Director for Collections and Research uh, at the Royal Ontario Museum as well. And I'm Terry Snowball from the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American Indian in Washington, D.C. I think what stood out for me was I wasn't expecting to get weepy. I don't know if that happened to other folks. I see it happen. Um, I think the reunion, just the, the just watching that poll uh, get replicated. I mean, as an, a West Coaster, I also know that our carvers talk about cult when they carve poles. It's usually a thousand dollars a foot. So I really thought that Stockholm was getting a deal, <laughs> like they were being generously offered something you know, that comes from the heart of the community. And I thought that was really meaningful that that they at least negotiated that generosity because I think that came from the heart of their own culture to see uh, see that generosity as a negotiating chip, I thought was meaningful. But I was um, emotionally taken aback by that. So sorry, folks. I was emotionally taken aback. That's, those are the films, I met Gil, the, during for the first film was the first time I'd met Gil. Um, we became friends after that, but I was I was at the time I was working at the CBC, and I met Gil when he came on to do a a show, and I was um, very intimidated because of course I had loved him since the '80s. He was very generous with me. We never met in person. We had an entire relationship over the phone, yeah. uh, but he was incredibly proud of these these movies. Um, so where did we where have we picked off? We just off. introduced ourselves. Oh, everyone is introduced. Sharing a moment that, you know, what struck me, what surprised me was that I was emotional when mm -hmm. I saw it, that it was, that the spirit of the community was awakened as they had discussed it with me. Well, these issues are, always, are, are emotional for us, because I think, um, you know, in the last panel, you and I were talking about even before this, you know, arts and culture in our communities are inseparable. They weren't, there was no word for art or art practice or you just were. That was part of it. And so when these things come back, it's, it is very emotional. Um, so a brief history lesson before we dive in more. Because uh, with all of Gil's films, there's so much layered in there that he lets... There's so much history in there. So um, the pole was uh, constructed in um, before, the po before the Indian Act. So 1772. So that's... Uh, Canada's only five years old. Right, if we're talking about Canada 150. Canada's only five years old. You're four years before the Indian Act came in, uh, which means you're eight years before the potlatch ban. That was the amendment to the Indian Act, which occurred in 1880. One of the main uh, factors of the potlatch ban, but besides outlawing our customs and traditions here in Canada, was it did allow the seizure of our cultural artifacts yeah. and objects to, to be taken out of our community because we weren't allowed to use them under the potlatch ban. And so that is how so many of the world's, not just Canadian museums, but the world's museums became uh, populated with this. So, so just so we're setting the context for the film because Gil doesn't totally cover all of that. Um, Terry, I'm also interested though, if you can maybe give us the American history of, of this because there were some similar, you had, there was a similar law to the, the potlatch ban in the States the, that outlawed indigenous ceremonies, but can, perhaps you can give us a bit of that history. <clears throat> well, I, um, I don't know if I can speak specifically to any sure. particular uh, article in that sense of the banning. Um, there was uh, systematic and, and policy-based types of uh, the, the outlaw and uh, uh, negation of native practices uh, and it wasn't until uh, down the road later on where the American Indian Religious Freedom Act re sort of reinstalled or reestablished some of those uh, so th so those rights for uh, indigenous peoples, but that was like happened sometimes in the 70s. Uh, and, but prior to that, um, or I should say more, more in line with uh, 
um, because there are numerous uh, types of protections and are resource types of laws, antiquities acts that sort of preserved uh, uh, the preservation or the management of, of what you would call consider material culture or uh, archaeological sites and things like that. So there were there were things in place to protect uh, not for the purpose of preserving the native culture for native peoples, but to create or preserve that resource for um, institutions and, uh, and and whatever kind of pursuits there were scientifically or uh, ethnographically in, in the acquisition of these kinds of materials. So those weren't working on uh, behalf or the interest of these, uh, these groups in, in the United States. Um, but <clears throat> so uh, just to, just to preface a little bit about the National Museum of American Indian, uh, in 1989 there was Public Law 101-185, which was created to uh, namely establish the National Museum of the American Indian. But with that too, uh, accompanying that, a sort of cornerstone was the actual establishment of the repatriation laws, uh, namely for the Smithsonian Institution. So it wasn't just uh, applying itself to the National Museum of American Indian, it was also applying itself to uh, the National Museum of Natural History, which is our sister institution in Washington, D.C., that also maintains its uh, own ethnographic collection and archaeological collections, uh, very extensive uh, uh, human remains collections as well, whereas the uh, National Museum of American Indian doesn't uh, maintain as much. But anyway, um, <clears throat> there were amendments uh, later on because in 1990, a domestic a larger domestic uh, legislation was in place called Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which was put in place um, to uh, open a wider access for federally recognized tribes in the United States to pursue repatriation uh, of ancestral remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. Uh, so under those circumstances or in those situations, um, we could look at something like this pole as being something which would have been considered an object of cultural patrimony, meaning no one person could alienate that from their community, let alone somebody from outside of that. Uh, and then also if there's sort of these sort of pre-existing laws that could have uh, applied themselves to those situations, uh, there would have been uh, earlier breach or, or sort of like illicit or illegal act in, in the acquisition of, or the taking of these kinds of things. So in the, similarly, um, we actually did a repatriation in 2000 uh, where we returned uh, a, a totem pole which was about 13.41 meters long. So that was a pretty long uh, totem. Actually, we FedExed it back to the community. So if you can imagine that. Um, but uh, in that sense, uh, it was both in, in looking at our policies from collections, policy from that standpoint, those are objects illegally acquired, but also in our legislation with the repatriation, they were objects of cultural patrimony. So both things were applicable in the sense of saying it was more than compelling for us to want to return these things uh, at the museum's expense, because for us, repatriation in that regard would returning things back to tribes is just adding insult to injury, you know, when you're saying, here's your things, but, oh, by the way, you have to pay for it. So we underwrite those kinds of uh, things to take place. Um, <clears throat> and I won't get too much more tangential, but I hope that kind of answered a little bit of the context of that. And Mark and Jenna, give me a little bit idea of the, the ROM position here in terms of the history and, and how, do, how does this work now repatriation of an artifact with the Royal Ontario Museum. So if I'm a community and, and I know there's a sacred object or an, uh, uh, an object that should be, the community would like returned, how does that work within the Royal Ontario Museum? Okay, well we have several policies at the museum and of course these are, and I think the spirit of the museum too has been changed with the Truth and Reconciliation Act and with the uh, with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and so on. I think you've seen a real sea change with museums in general and it's not true of our institution as well. Uh, we are all about access to for uh, items. Uh, so if people want to visit the items, we have a sacred room where where they where items can be smudged or we can smoke grass. It's the only, it's a smoke sweet grass. It's the only place in the museum you can actually uh, 
have a separate room where you can actually light a fire <laughs> besides anywhere else in the museum. But the uh, but we're also about repatriation of objects. So if, if a community, if an object is, so we have two policies, one is for sa for sacred goods and for goods of cultural patrimony, and a second one is for any, anything but human remains or grave goods. Uh, if anyone wants to, uh, in any group, wishes to approach the museum, they uh, just have to, they, they come in and we talk about it and, uh, uh, and then we go through a process of identifying find the object, making sure whoever is making the claim or making the, the request is actually, uh, sometimes we have multiple claims with the same object, so we have to determine which, which group they may go back to. Uh, but we are, if the object is sacred or cultural patrimony, we are, uh, we determine, we, with the group, determine what's the best way of having access to the objects. And in many cases, that will be in terms of repatriation of the objects back to the community. So. Uh, we await people to approach us, and in some cases, we actually proactively contact groups if we think we have something uh, that should be returned. Uh, then we'll try to. Then we start the process of trying to contact the groups. So uh, we're again for us, it's about communities having access to the objects that are important to them, whether it be at the museum or be in their own communities. I think something that I've learned in the humble three and a half years that I've worked at the Royal Ontario Museum is that. Uh, one of the unique features, certainly where I work in the learning department, is that the community at large has access to um, handling ancestral objects, which is really a unique asset to the ROM collection. So we actually have an indigenous classroom set of objects that we work with quite actively to engage communities so that our objects aren't just sitting behind glass, that we actually do a lot of work to engage it. And my role in the, in the learning department is also to engage an Indigenous advisory circle of Indigenous knowledge carriers, elders, youth, people who are working in public service, but folks that are all devoted to education, Indigenous education in some way. And we've been given very strict, uh, not strict, but been very clear lines that our recon act of reconciliation is through participation, not just entertainment. So the ROM um, is very keen, uh, certainly in the learning department, to actively engage community and give community access to those ancestral objects. And we've actually really worked hard in our learning department to even get our staff to not call the uh, objects in the museum artifacts mm -hmm. because our elders in this region and what you could see in the film is that all of those ancestor objects have spirit. They were made with spirit, they were meant for the unborn and even if we look at the date and go, hey, I was unborn since then, it's meant for our unborn and the unborn to come. So what's beautiful about the ancestor objects in the Royal Ontario Museum collection is that it helps us fulfill a continuum of relationships. It allows us to access the past. We also allow um, those, those past um, those objects from the past help our generation now to see ourselves represented in a public space, but it also allows to, to manifest a sense of relationship in the future. And I think what I liked most about the, the way this story unfolded was that the community got their wish, which is to lay that pole to rest. So they may lay it to rest in a, a, um, like a very highly what's the word, like environmentally sensitive environment, but I think that it was cool spirit of the community to sort of win over and we lay the pole to rest, that we wouldn't erect it again. I say we lovingly, but I just, I applauded their efforts to sort of define a win-win out of that, right? Because I think it was a, a hard, a hard journey for them all. And of course it's those sorts of nuances, mm -hmm. both in terms of display and how you treat these objects and their meaning that is a big cultural shift for museums and, and these institutions to understand those sorts of obligations and, and treatment of that. I imagine it's not always an easy for process. Sure. Well, a contemporary example is our current Anishinaabeg Art and Power exhibition, which is a really solid example, and I think Mark and I can agree, of engaging community in a heartfelt way. We have indigenous curators, guest curators that helped us alongside one of our own curators. And we've got out of our way to actually train indigenous docents so that we center indigenous voice where the, the actual exhibition is concerned. And the whole intent of that whole exhibition was for our younger generation to see themselves represented in a public institution. And what's beautiful about it is that someone asked me during the indigenous docent training, were the contemporary pieces of art, were they considered ancestral objects, and I said, absolutely, they're ancestral objects, even if they're made out of computer bits, because they were made with the intention of replicating 
uh, that ancestral knowledge, but through contemporary mediums. And like any culture, indigenous cultures are allowed to evolve. And so it was really lovely to see a bag there with an iPad in it. It's like, yeah, I, yeah I, I could use a bag like that in contemporary times. But it's a really meaningful way of seeing what happens when you do actually engage uh, museums from the grassroots and see that through and allow for the community to have their fingerprints on it and have their voice represented and central to the exhibition. So I think in many ways the Indigenous Advisory Circle and a lot of our efforts to have um, um, activities that are reconciliation through participation, not just song and dance, but that we actually leave a memorable impact, not just for mainstream Canadians who come and visit the ROM, but for everybody, Indigenous community and children alike. And when I first got hired at the ROM, my youngest said, you work at our museum? And I just thought that's our next tagline, man. <laughs> is that we, it is, it is Royal Ontario's museum. So I really love that uh, you know, we can be the custodians of holding that um, information and that knowledge and find, always find ways to activate, including hiring six indigenous knowledge resource teachers, albeit part-time, it, it's permanent six positions. So it's actually gonna allow us to deepen our ability to authentically represent our objects through our classroom visits and um, through some of our guided tours. So I'm quite excited that ROM is playing an constantly an active role in, in engaging community. The only comment I would add to that is that I think it's very, very important for us as a museum. If we're going, if we're really going to change, uh, I think the actual the indigenous voice in the museum has to be first person, and it can't always be delivered by a third party. Uh, and that's I think some of the biggest, as Jeanette was saying, some of the biggest changes that we're making in the museum is to hire indigenous people as either docents or in this case they're volunteering, uh, but the uh, indigenous teachers. Uh, and this fall, we're starting to search for a new curator. Uh, for our collections, and that person will be indigenous, and so that I'm and I'm expecting that we will increase the number of staff who are indigenous, and so that when people come and come to the museum to hear stories of it, if they happen to be in the museum, uh, that those will be first person stories and not being told through the middleman. Oh, I love that. Now, now Terry, you're a bit blessed because you get a whole museum uh, just onto the onto indigenous peoples. Yeah, and, and I just first let me say. Uh, this is the second time I've seen both films, mm. and uh, I could probably go back to it and you know, or maybe numerous times and see different things. So there's something in in the skill of the uh, you know the directing that that's able to harvest these kinds of things, and I might I might get back to that at some point. But you know, in talking and looking about and talking about the uh, material culture of, of these various indigenous groups. Um, I actually work at the storage facility in Suitland, Maryland, which is about 12 kilometers outside of uh, Washington, D.C., and our museum, of course, is downtown. Um, that's in excess of over 800,000 objects uh, from indigenous peoples from the Western Hemisphere. And, and the really amazing thing about that is that, um, of course, you know, you've got some of the Western views of, of you know, like that's the one thing that was interesting to me is that there was this imposition of saying this thing needs to go into a stable environment and be preserved in you know in perpetuity. Whereas contextually, they're saying no, this was intended to fall and and leave it you know serve its purpose and go back into you know go back into the earth. And <clears throat> you know, so from that standpoint, uh, there there are contrary views of you know how Western the Western view of indigenous peoples are, you know, it's, it's very contradictory sometimes because uh, when going back to looking and working in that collection, you can literally see the reflection or, or the, the echoing of the environment that these people come from, uh, the very resource and innovation, they, all of these very diverse types of environments that they've had to survive in, just unimaginable. And the creativity and innovation they've used and devised to not only survive but to continue to innovate. Um, you know, you see the introduction of the, the, the you know the, the Western experience and, and the things that happened through that. Native people continue to survive and adapt, and, and we're very progressive from that standpoint. And I think that's one of the things that's important to be shared here at any type of uh, venue or, or exhibit or, or interpretation of that culture is just to say how adaptive things are. You know, and you're not just telling the Native American story, the indigenous First Nations story anymore. You're talking, you're talking about a story of experience and exchange that's happened 
through time. You know, and as it says in the movie, you know, they, they said the, that those people, the Swedes, were a part of that experience. I was like, and that's sort of the, you know, sort of the empathy that's, I think, important or is required to sort of bridge, you know, the ideas of saying who and what we are, you know. And, um, and I think, Jesse, you said, made a number of reflections uh, with um, Neil Diamond's film. You know, there's a number of insights there in terms of saying, you know, who and what we are and, and what we choose to be for ourselves. So, anyway. A reference to Real Engine, a fine movie that I happen to star in. So thank you, Terry, for that reference. I've been to the community center at the Smithsonian in Maryland, an extraordinary place. Um, I was able to go into the stacks, and they were able to show me um, objects from my community, hundreds of years old, that I've never seen in my life. They just have a drawer that they could pull out. It was an extraordinary Extraordinary experience. I urge anyone um, to go to the to the Smithsonian period, but it's particularly the the National Museum of the American Indian. Mark, it's interesting though, because because the the Smithsonian Museum had a law passed around it that had repatriation foundationally built into it. The ROM came before any of that. Um, so how is it to take what was and is a colonial institution and sort of adapt it to? This outlook, you know, is because I, I think from my point of view, this is an obligation that the ROM has to do. Is that what is it? Do you feel it is an obligation being fulfilled with this new approach? Uh, at, well, absolutely, it's an obligation, and uh, you know, old old institutions turn hard, <laughs> and uh, and I think it's it's a, it's a process that's evolving. I don't think we've been perfect in the past, and we won't be perfect in the future. I don't think, but. Uh, as we move forward, I think it's an absolute ob obligation of us. It's, uh, it's, it's again. I think the way we'll make real change is to make it through the staff. I think we'll also make it through our board of trustees, as we have more Indigenous people on the board of trustees, and uh, the whole the whole attitude of the institution will change. I, I think it's kind of instructive. Into so we've I've been involved with several recent repatriation, uh, uh, you know, activities that we've done, uh, and. The very first one that I was involved with many, many years ago was uh, was actually uh, out west to uh, repatriate uh, a couple, two beaver bundles and a headdress bundle uh, back uh, to Alberta. And one of the comments that somebody made, again, it's, it's this museum idea that you're going to save everything and preserve everything, and it was the same one expressed by the, by in Sweden, was the idea that once we repatriate these bundles that we had somehow to ensure that they were going to be preserved. So there, so one of the staff members had suggested, well, let's when we give it back, let's when we repatriate it, let's give it back on permanent loan, mm -hmm. which means that you know that we you know we're always kind of keeping tabs on it to make sure that it's going to be you know. And I said no, <laughs> you know that it's incredibly patronizing for one thing, but it, but it's they're actually the objects are not being returned to go on display somewhere else. The objects are being returned to you be used. You know, and eventually they will. You know, they they won't they won't exist anymore. But they'll be, they'll be and that's, uh, and we're not repatriating repatriating to an institute or to an individual. We're repatriating to re bringing it back to a community. So uh, it was, and that's been the case all along. Is that once we we repatriate an object or a, or a series of of uh, items that they are, you know, they're going to be back and be used in the community. Uh, and that's almost inevitably the case, or they, or in some cases they may be reburied if they've been come from a grave, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, I guess, uh, I think, you know, kind of old habits die hard at, at a museum, but I, th I see some, some incredible momentum, uh, and I think we're really turning a corner, and uh, I think people are a little less, uh, less afraid of the idea that you're going to let something go, a little, a little less afraid of the idea that something may go and, and may no longer exist after a period of time. Uh, but that it's, you know, we hold them in trust. We don't own them. And I think it's time to bring, give them back to the communities, uh, you know, for, for whom they're most important. Just like the land, by the way, Mark. We hold it in trust. <laughs> well, we that's don't own it. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> um, if I could just uh, t touch on, uh, I too have uh, participated in the return of beaver bundles with the Siksika, uh or, or the Pagan, and... Um, you know, and then also too, can I have to confess that I'm actually, um, you know, a traditional person. So I still uh, practice and, and 
participate in our traditional ceremonies back home. Call me a pagan. Call me what you will. You know, whatever. Um, but but in that in that dynamic, we have things within our culture and our practices that um, sort of enable the renewal of something ceremonially. And if you look at the relationship that, uh, say, uh, a man and a woman who are caretakers or bundle keepers, you know, they have a very, very intimate and distinct relationship with, with the bundle where that same dynamic is maintained and continued. And only sort of restoring these things are you then able to sort of uh, re, you know, sort of resurrect or reanimate those things back into, you know, back into their context and, and uh, we just recently repatriated four bundles back uh, to the whole collective in the sense of the, the Black, Blackfoot Confederacy was involved with that. And, um, and, and they feel at this time, this point in time, it's very important that these things come back because of these things are going to help their communities. Uh, and one of the, the reserves, one of the reservations we were on, uh, we're literally taking a tour they were showing us uh, their, you know, their their settlements and their developments, um, and they said uh, that some of the, the the houses that you saw boarded up were meth houses. And I swear to God, every other house that we drove past in this one neighborhood was boarded up, and that speaks to a greater urgency that they feel that these things have the power to sort of do is to sort of help recover or help heal, you know, their their own people. So they're very important from the cultural dynamic. It's not just them. Uh, there are a great many things that are plaguing communities today, you know. And, and what we saw in the film today was just one of those experiences. It was belabored in many ways because um, you saw this outpouring of generosity and industry on their part. Where, uh, on the other hand, there really wasn't a lot. You know, there was not as much recipro you know reciprocity as you would want to see. You know, and so, you know, so f from that standpoint, you know, as I, I've, like I said, I've been uh, involved with repatriation for 20 years now, and I've done you know, the escort of remains, the preparation of remains, the reburials, preparation of ceremonial objects, and things going back to communities, um, you know, returning house fronts back to Tlingit communities, or, or just uh, uh, re returning an abuelo back to community in northern Chile, the Aymara people and they're helping them rebury them. They all have their own experiences from a colonial, post-colonial standpoint, but they all have their ways in which they are trying to uh, heal themselves. Sorry. I wanted to add just a little more context to the potlatch ban. So I, I do this a lot when I'm, I'm doing tours, and I, I repeat the dates, 1884 to 1951, 1884 to 1951. The dates don't change, 1884 to 1951. That's the potlatch ban. So what would happen, what stands out for me is that while we were hearing throughout the film that an ancestral object that has been made would naturally be laid to rest after time. It, the spirit would expire and it would weather. And Well, because of that 76-year ban, those objects would expire, but then the next generation would step up and be inspired to replicate it. But because of the potlatch ban, that's where I wanted to throw that in there. The, our culture was, I say interrupted. I have elders around me that say severed. But I think if we say severed, my children and my unborn grandchildren are cut off. And I'm not keen to say severed because after my own experience of being raised in multiple foster care and you know spend a career and a lifetime always coming home through my culture and through art, I think I even wore something I made on purpose today because I'm white on my, my father's side, so I've got clocks. And on my, my native side, I've got an image of a sun just sort of going with the flow. But because I straddle both worlds, I think it's really vital that you know, people respond to numbers. So 76 years of culture being interrupted, it's hard for communities to replicate that knowledge that has been, you know, that populates our museum. So I'm, 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 I walk very gingerly on this topic because um, I also think it's really vital that museums play a really powerful role to help rekindle that and make ready for the next generation to see themselves represented in public spaces. 
but it can grow, that it's not just our art from the past, but our contemporary art and art that's yet to be made. So I think museums also play an important uh, part, a role in keeping the conversation going as opposed to just coveting and, and, and you know, having things. Um, and I think the kind of work that we're doing at the Royal Ontario Museum, we're getting suggestions, like even with the Anishinaabeg Art and Power exhibit, We've got people who are from this area saying, we want to offer tobacco. What is our option? So our organizers have said, we'll make something available to you. So starting tomorrow, there will be a, split, a place within two places within the in that particular exhibition where you can make a tobacco offering. And if that doesn't make sense to mainstream culture, that's OK, because it's probably not your thing. And it might not mean a lot to you. But having that type of grassroots input, that it's important to them, and having an institution like the Romsey Yes, we'll take care of your needs and help feed the spirit of these objects that are on display. I think that gives us a lot of a lot of credibility at the community level to to build those important relationships. And I heard an elder back home. He went like this, not to to denote money, but he said, "Ritual makes our prayers physical." And one of the hopes that we have in the work that we're doing with our Indigenous Advisory Circle are include opportunities to feast the objects that we do work with on a regular basis. Like in the hands-on gallery, we have a whole wall of animal skulls. All of those animal skulls, albeit, you know, they look dead by Western estimation, like they're, you know, they've been, you know, skinned and everything. <laughs> but in indigenous worldview, they're still very much alive. The spirit is working, it's on display, and we need to honor the spirit of those objects. So we have ongoing conversations with our indigenous advisory circle, and as our our galleries start to, to take shape and you know as we start to you know rotate objects in the future we also think of engaging community to help come feast you know and say if there's been a drum on display we've had people say that drum has a spirit in it that drum needs to be played we have to work very closely with museum professionals conservation some of those drums are like 100 or more years old so you know it's a larger conversation because I think it's vital that we also honor the spirit of that ancestral object, but we also have conversation with conservation. Do we risk, you know, wrecking that object or you know, damaging that object in any way? So that's we're always negotiating, you know. But I, I just want to know that you know that as indig more indigenous professionals are in the museum, we'll have more conversations to uh, change, you know, change some of the dynamics where indigenous people will influence, you know, some positive outcomes from that. Because, I mean, the time that I've been there, Ram is very amenable to sort of growing with the times, right? And the conversations are always going to be there. And we're in a unique position and a leadership position to work very closely with the community too. I think, I mean, I think having just watched the movie, which is now, you know, 20-ish years old, I think considering the discussions we're having shows the progress that has been made. If you just, if we, you know, we just watched a movie and we're just hearing a much different um, conversation. Um, so I, a couple of points I want to touch on. What you mentioned at the beginning, that 76 year gap, you know, when we get in debates around cultural appropriation in Canada, this is the real, you know, this is why it's it's a nuanced, I don't even want to say it's, it's um, um, you know, this is a lived thing. This is not a nuance, nuance sort of rhetorical argument or something in the abstract. This was 76 years of actual cultural theft and appropriation. So this is what informs this debate on a sort of uh, larger scale. We mentioned reconciliation. I think this is a very important part of reconciliation, but I love it when I have my uh, cousins from the South up here to talk reconciliation. Because Ter Terry, I mean, it's July 4th. Independence Day for you down there, I guess. Not for you, but maybe. Well, for here you. I'm feeling truly independent. So <laughs> thank you for that. But I mean, we Canada just went through this TRC. Can you imagine, maybe not with the current president, but can you imagine a moment when you could have a similar process in the in the states? Do you even think it's necessary in the states? Well, I mean, I think uh, previously with um, uh, the, the previous president. You know, the, he was actually, he, uh, in his two terms, had actually initiated the, the, the convening of the, all of the federally recognized tribes to have these conversations and have a more meaningful 
kind of dialogue and, and also uh, a more synth- sympathetic ear, ear to the issues and the, uh, the challenges that tribes had. And so there, there would be an initial introduction or conversation you'd have with the tribal leaders, and then it would shift over to the t- types of agencies like the Department of Interior, uh, other agencies that would work with the tribes to sort of uh, make, uh, you know, sort of, maybe come to terms with, with some of the issues that are, you know, sort of uh, challenging the tribes. Uh, but, you know, s- but some of these laws that we have in place and some of the, the things that are, are maintained, the American Indian, uh, National Congress of the American Indians, uh, other types of collectives, which, are, you know, sort of serve to, to both in regions, um, you know, sort of serve their interests both politically uh, there's an economic presence that these nations have th- that are very important from that standpoint of influence. Uh, uh, but there's still even greater reconciliation that, that goes on from that standpoint. And um, I think one of the most amazing things that's happened, um, and not just to Native people, but more specifically to Native people, with the Standing Rock Reservation and the challenges at the tribes, you've seen a great many tribes that came together to fight on the issues of environmental protections and water, water protections and, and things that are that are just sort of universal in terms of those types of uh, preservations and or you know sort of uh, for future generations and you know and, and there you see uh, the influences of policy that that sort of can change the, the tone of things and it's really sort of where tribes uh, and nations and people that help them have to get as far along in, in a process as they can, uh, not knowing when or how those things are going to ultimately be uh, cr- you know, uh, imposed by some form of setback. So, th- so there are those things uh, f- from a reconciliation process that might be forward moving again in some way. But uh, again, it's sort of both socially and politically, um, you know, everybody needs to be aware of the things that are you know, and I think people are from that standpoint. This is uh, a moment in time where a great many nations and a great many people came together. Uh, people from all over the world came to support that cause. And, and it's a universal thing. But, um, and I don't mean to be so environmental or so, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, proactive or, 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 or activist. In, in that sense, I, uh, you know, because I observe things, try to observe things from a neutral standpoint because you, you also have to maintain some form of objectivity and looking at to see how, what advances, what opportunities there are in terms of making advances. Yeah. One of, one of uh, the opportunities we've seized at the Royal Ontario Museum is investing in the next generation. We have a ROM youth cabinet that the, that the learning department initiated. And what's exciting about the youth cabinet is that when we got the funding, we were told to generate an Indigenous youth leadership program. And our Indigenous advisory circle said, absolutely not. We are not going to isolate Indigenous youth. But what we will encourage is an Indigenous youth-led youth initiative. So we have indigenous philosophies that guide the ROM youth cabinet. And so young people from across cultures actually get immersed in indigenous worldviews and see the ROM and our activities are, are based on engaging with ancestral objects. And some of those young people tell stories about their own ancestral objects. But the other part of that is we have an indigenous youth intern. We call the Kyle Wynn Memorial Indigenous Youth Internship. And so for three years in a row, we actually have another intern, Bella McQuatch, in our audience here. And I think it's really vital that our up and coming next generation are always in the wings listening, hearing you know some of these challenging conversations and knowing that they are part of the next ripple of arts leadership. And I think the ROM has shown a firm commitment that indigenous youth are a real vital part of our success because then it really allows for that grassroots engagement to continually be authenticated every time we we have young people come through our doors. And that relationship with the community that we see form ultimately Mm -hmm. in the film over repatriation, you can build from the get-go in a different sort of way. Um, We got time for a couple questions, so if you've got, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Yes. Just let us get a mic to you so everyone can hear you on YouTube. Is there money for our, um, indigenous communities who want to repatriate objects? 
but are facing the same kind of financial difficulties um, that were portrayed in the film. It's one thing to wish to have their objects, but to to raise the funds to transport them and to to house them is another thing altogether. That's an issue, actually. It, it remains in Canada. So Canada, we don't have the same kind of legislation that they have in the States, so we don't have NAGPRA and so on that's guiding us. We have the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and I think it, you know, in some ways that will help guide us and maybe arrive at mutual understanding uh, and maybe a better way to proceed. But what it doesn't provide is federal funding, which is available sometimes in the States, uh, to, to facilitate the uh, um, repatriation. Uh, and uh, so we have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis and try to raise the funds. In some cases, there aren't a lot of funds that are required, so we just did a, a repatriation of, of uh, a large number of false face masks to a false face society, and that's a matter of, you know, us building, some, uh, building the crates and being able to transfer them, and that's not a big issue. But in other cases, there may be, if it involves reburial or something, there may be actually, you know, quite... A, a number of costs, and then we mutually face the problem of how do we raise this money to be able to do it. So, yeah, the answer is in in Canada, uh, we don't have access to the federal funds at the moment uh, to be able to uh, to facilitate some of these kinds of transfers and to be able to speed the process up. So we face yeah. the same dilemma. Uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, Smithsonian is not subject to NAGPRA because its own legislation and both Natural History and uh, National Museum of American Indian receive uh, their own budgets for, for that kind of support in uh, you know, supporting, uh, namely, federally recognized tribes in the United States. Um, but there, there are some exceptions from that standpoint, both in Natural History and the, and the NMEI, uh, where actually we, in our policy, have opened ourselves uh, beyond the socio-political borders uh, uh, because there's five categories of repatriation that are uh, legally uh, available to tribes, which is the human remains, funerary objects, unassociated funerary objects, objects, cultural patrimony, and sacred objects. In that instance, um, and similarly, uh, not that uh, in Canada, First Nations groups are recognized as, as uh, tribes or First Nations sovereign nations. Uh, we extend our policy to that full degree in terms of those categories. So we've we've participated with uh, several tribes this past couple of uh, months uh, from uh, the Quebec region, but also too uh, NAGPRA uh, makes available a certain amount of funding which tribes have to compete for for the grants. So again, those those accompanying legislation have that type of funding resource available. One more. If we got time for one more, if there's one more. No? Well, go check out the ROM, because the new show is, is uh, great. Check out The Whale, if you haven't seen The Whale, the Amazing Whale. And if you can make it down to uh, the Smithsonian, can recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's worth the trip every time for me. Uh, Jeanette, Mark, Terry, McWitch, thank you so much for coming and sharing us uh, with this evening. Uh, as Bingawashi will continue next month, where we will show uh, Two Worlds Colliding, uh, which is a film about uh, indigenous peoples and the justice system, or, or more aptly put, the legal system. Not much justice there. Uh, so we'll have lots of people there to um, discuss that. Thank you all for coming, and miigwech. Thank you. Thank you.